Hello, it's been a long time, but we're back. Sorry about the absence, it's been a bit of a busy couple of weeks for us here. But this is episode 9. Tired of being tired. I'm Andre. And I'm Kirsten. And this is my lovely wife. Today it's her story, and some of the struggles I would say that she faces on a daily basis. This one is a hard one to listen to, probably, and a hard one to do if you're my poor wife. But we thought this was something worth talking about. We wanted to raise awareness and let you know that if you suffer in the same way, you're not on your own. Because I think a lot of times people have these these thoughts and these problems and these, these focus issues where they cannot talk to anybody else about them. And they might think, well, if you go to therapy all week, this is not the case. This has never been the case. So if you are a listener of this podcast, this particular episode, and you feel like this is very me, everything said here or lots of things relate to how I feel, then you're not alone. You're definitely not alone. So tell me in, in your own words, what, what does this, what does anxiety mean to you and how does it affect your life? Well, anxiety is more a part of me than anything else, I think, sometimes. It has been there my entire life. And sometimes when I look back at my childhood and my teenage years and I think of situations that I was in, um, you know, things that happened during school, all those kind of things. And back then, no one used the term anxiety. It wasn't a thing. You didn't say, you know, or, or I think if it was, it was much more of a serious thing. Like if you had anxiety, you were medicated and had therapy. And, you know, it was a, it, nobody really talked about it as just a generalized, oh, you just got anxiety. It was, you know, not really spoken about. And it's only looking back now that I can see perhaps if I'd known that's what it was or the people around me knew that that's what it was that maybe I could have got some help or advice and you know how to deal with those situations um whereas instead I just internalized it because that was all I knew how to do um it just made me a very shy child so instead of you know people around me being able to say oh this situation makes her really anxious let's think about how we can support her through it or change it or do whatever it's just oh she's shy you know she'll just have to get over it or grow out of it and this is absolutely not me criticizing my family or the people around me because they didn't know you know it, it, like I said it wasn't a thing that anybody spoke about so this is not to blame anybody at all. It's just to highlight that this has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. Um, and I can only really put it down to the last maybe five to 10 years that I've really started to understand how anxiety affects everything that I do. Um, and kind of makes me the person that I am in a way, um, you know, for the good and for the, for the bad. Um, but it's something that I think, well, we think, don't we, that should be spoken about. Yeah. So sure. that, you know, there are other people because it's a really, really lonely thing to have. It really brings out all the worst thoughts that you have um, about yourself, about the situations around you, uh, about the world, everything. It just pulls on all the negative um, feelings that you could ever possibly have and it magnifies them and puts you in the loneliest places um, and makes it really difficult for you to vocalize them. Yeah. Um, and want to, like even just trying to prepare to talk about this, I have. It's been a bit of procrastination station. There's been a been. lot. We've talked about it for a while. And every time I've thought I'm going to write some notes 
because I forget things. So it would be good to have an idea. I, I just can't bring myself to do it because it's that I don't want to think about it. I don't want to draw attention to it in my brain yeah. because that's kind of how I live my life is let's not address it right now. Um, it's a British attitude in some ways. Yeah. It's also yeah. pride because we think that we're strong enough to deal with any and everything on our own. Men and doctors, for example. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's it's all part and parcel of the same sort of thing. I think it is necessary to address these things and to air them to somebody that you trust um, wherever possible. Because yeah. if you do that and you have those conversations, it can take some of the stress away. We know this firsthand. Yeah. So... It's the normalizing as well because you actually realize that there are so many people that have various degrees of anxiety um you know not everybody has it to the point where it controls their life um i think everybody suffers with it at some point don't you know even you who's not an anxious person no you know doing a, a gig on your own or with New one other person well. yeah yep. that makes you anxious and that's completely normal that's how almost you should feel because if you didn't it kind of shows that you don't care about that you know um you know when you have people that stand up in front of hundreds of thousands of people having to give a speech you you have to feel anxiety it gives you that adrenaline to get through to get through it yeah but, I, I think my first real experience with that was a few years ago when I went and speak at Cambridge yeah that was my first ever public speaking event yeah. and I was nervous as hell. I mean, I don't think I've ever been so nervous for a gig or any other thing in my life. But when I sat down and I started talking, because I had to do it, and that's the thing, if you're forced to do something in that way, you kind of can't not do it. So when I started talking, it became a lot easier. And I realized, actually, you know what? I'm not bad at this. Talky malarkey. I quite like it. And, and your confidence in everything has grown. And now you find those situations relatively easy. Yeah. I'm not saying, you know, that you love doing them necessarily, but you do just... I kind of do though, you know, I fell into, I went from one extreme to the other. I didn't yeah. want to do it at first and I hated the idea of it, but then I did it and I found actually not bad. I quite like it and I love it. I like presenting, um, sharing things with people and that's why I do YouTube and stuff and the podcast as well. Because it was me who kind of asked you to do this. It was all you. <clears throat> yeah <laughs> definitely kind of all you but that's the difference i think between having a normal level of anxiety and having suffering with anxiety because for me i can think of hundreds of examples of things that i have either stopped doing not done in the first place or completely not even thought about because of the anxiety and that's the difference is i very rarely can say to myself you have to do this it's going to be fine we'll get through it it's a i will do whatever i can to avoid that situation yeah. and i've always done that um since being a child you know through my teens avoiding going out into situations with friends all kinds of things um that i will come up with any excuse to avoid that situation and that is because the anxiety is so strong that the thought of doing it and the act of doing it just feels completely impossible. And you can say, but I'll I'll do it and I'll feel better. And obviously there are sometimes situations that you do have to do, you know, whether it's, I can't think of an example, but maybe like a medical thing or, a, you know, a work thing or whatever it is particularly when you have children, sometimes there are things that you just have to suck it up and do it because you have to do it for your child. Well, there was the Disney trip. There was the Disney trip, yes. You did um, that very successfully. Absolutely. Um, and I came through that and that was great. And now I think, oh, that was fantastic. But there are other situations that you have to go through and you think, okay, it, it will be okay when it's done. I just need to get through it and it'll be okay. But then afterwards, and people will say to you, You'll do it the first time and it'll be hard, but then you'll do it again and it will be easier. For me, it's not. It, it doesn't get easier. It's yeah. exactly the same because your brain tricks you and it says, okay, you did it that first time. 
and you survived and it was okay, but next time it might not be. And that's the thing. You can't rationalize that voice. You can try, but you can't make it go away altogether. It's always there. It's always saying to you the worst possible scenario. And when you have that 24 hours a day, because it's always there, It's there through every single moment of your life, walking down the street, doing menial tasks, jobs, you know, relationships, whatever it might be. It's always there speaking to you. And that is absolutely exhausting. And I think that's also something that people may not necessarily understand if you don't have anxiety, is the mental exhaustion of constantly having to fight against your own brain, the own your own voice in your head telling you these awful things and you're constantly having to remind it that you're better than that. Quite right. And I guess it just depends on how strong you're feeling that day as to how how much you listen to it. And um, how, how easy it is to put it aside. Yeah. You know, if you're having a good positive day, you can... Uh, there mm. might be moments in that day where you struggle, but you might be able to say, well, it's okay. You know, we don't need to go down that road. But if you're having a a difficult day, it's very easy for that to take over and it spirals. And, you know, depending on what situations are going on around you, you can can find yourself in a, yeah, in a very difficult place. And it's also incredibly difficult to explain to somebody whether they understand anxiety or not. It's incredible incredibly difficult to explain how you're feeling in that moment especially if you don't really know why you know it's it's okay to say oh I feel really anxious because tomorrow I've got a job interview or I have to have this important phone call or go to a doctor's appointment there's a reason there's something that you can attribute it to but when there is nothing and you have the very physical signs of anxiety the you know sick feeling the pit of your stomach the heart racing the 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 anxious feeling running through your whole body the adrenaline all of those things and you don't know what it what the cause is what the reason you can't do anything it just is there and it doesn't matter what you do or how you try there is no way to vocalize that and I think that's why a lot of people myself included don't say anything because how can you explain something that you don't know and you don't really understand in that moment? Yeah. And what can anyone else do? You know, what what can you expect somebody to say to you when you don't know what's wrong? Yourself. Yeah. You know, if I came to you and said, I just feel really anxious and I don't know why, it would be really difficult for you to respond because you don't know why. You can offer comfort in that moment, which is all that, you know... Anybody can do, really. Yeah. But there is no fixing it. No. It's that learning to sit with it and try and get through it. So what have you done in lieu of mitigation as much as you can do yourself? Um, Well, that's a question. (laughs) Yeah, the bit like, what kind of steps do do you take? I still think I'm trying to figure out steps. There isn't a huge amount um, that I necessarily do. I would say, though, in the last few years, maybe the last year, really, I've got better at trying to communicate with you, especially. Um, And probably those closest to me. Um... But even that's quite difficult because nobody wants to feel like a burden. And, you know, other people have their lives and their problems. And we can all say, you know, friends, family, whatever, they always want to be there for you. And that's fine. Of course they do. And you want to be there for them. But in the depths of that anxiety, you don't want to become another reason, another worry for them, another burden on them. That's you know so I don't think I necessarily have any steps to help I just I'm still trying to figure it out there has been talk of therapy 
Um, what do you think about the idea of therapy in general, not specifically? I think if you can get therapy, you should. It's it's hard now, you know, going to the doctor and speaking to them and then being referred to therapy. And even then, when you have therapy, it's such a short period of time in your life. Um, but it is helpful if you can. Um, just having somebody that you you don't feel like you are burdening, you know, that's their job. Their they're, job they're not connected yeah. to you. They're not going to take your worries on and, you know, your anxiety and sit with it because they don't know who you are. It, to them, you're just another person. So, you know, I think if you can, then therapy is hugely helpful and can, I think they, they're really good at trying to steer you in the right direction of knowing how to vocalize what you're feeling. Um and maybe being able to explain it to you because sometimes that's that's the thing it's scary when you don't know why you're feeling like you are so having a health professional in that context say to you well that's okay that symptom that feeling whatever it is there's nothing medically wrong with you it's the anxiety is you know is really helpful all right so i've got a few questions for you then um, from the side of, let's say, somebody doesn't know if somebody is, I don't know what you call it really, someone that suffers with anxiety, for example. Yeah. They want to they help them or they feel like they could be doing something more than they are. What can someone who doesn't suffer do for someone that does or think that so they, they know someone who does? How can they be of assistance, if at all, right? Mm -hmm. how, can they, how can they benefit, if possible, that, that person? Well, I mean, you can see the signs usually, you know, if you're close to that person, you know when they're not quite right. And But the thing is, people have this issue, they don't want to butt their nose into people's business. No, that's true. Just asking if you're okay and if you need to talk. For me, I mean, it really depends on the person because... We've been together long, so I know how to, to talk to you. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> you do. But, but I'm not sure that if another person said to me are you okay? Do you need to talk? Unless it was, you know, somebody extremely close to me, I wouldn't be opening up to anybody. Now, other people might be different. Um, this is so it. It, could, just, it could open a floodgate. And I think it's just, how can you ask the right question while being sensitive and not being a busybody? Well, if you're close enough to that person to understand or to see that there is something wrong, then I don't think you know, offering to be an ear to listen is being a busybody. Obviously, if you keep asking yeah, sure. and keep probing, then... Like your elderly neighbour. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, just being supportive, just being understanding. I think, you know, there are lots of people with anxiety, me included, who will avoid situations, social situations, Um at any cost because that the social anxiety is a crippling one because it stops you from being around people and that makes you even you know feel even worse like you're letting people down you know it's a lonely place even more so so being understanding if you've made plans with a friend or family member or somebody and then they cancel at the last minute it's annoying to you of course it is but most of the time, if anxiety is the cause, it's nothing to do with you. It's to do with them. They just can't manage it in that moment. Yeah. And being understanding and not being cross or upset with them, even if internally you are, just try to understand that it's, it's a really hard place to be. And yeah. you can say, yes, but if you just come out, you'll have so much fun. Why would you not want to, you know, it doesn't come really and help the situation. It, it doesn't because it's not, it's not about that. The anxiety just physically stops you from being able to do something. Um, so I think it is just that even if inside you can't understand, just try and present yourself to that person like, like you can. It, or admit it and just say, look, I can't understand how you're feeling right now but I get that it's really hard for you. 
and anything I can do, you know, I'm here, I think. Okay, and now the other side of the coin. You are somebody that suffers with anxiety and you want to tell somebody else, but you don't know how to, to, to uh, phrase it. What do you tell somebody that thinks they, can, they found someone they can tell, but doesn't know how to start the conversation? That's really hard to, <laughs> to answer because I don't know. I know. It, well, I, I, this was a tough question on purpose because these these are the hard because questions you're just trying we trying to challenge me, aren't you? <laughs> of course. I don't know. I mean, I think you have to have a lot of trust in that person that you think that they're, you know, not going to dismiss ear. you. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, a lot of people dismiss anxiety as, oh, you're just being silly. Just get over yourself. Just get over it. They do the same for depression. Absolutely. Um, and if you don't have it, you you don't understand. And, you know, I've said that to you in the past. You you can't understand. But at the same time, I can't expect you to understand because you don't have those feelings. And that's OK. It's OK if the person that you're telling doesn't understand. They just need to be willing to listen. Yeah. And that's the most important thing so you just need to find somebody that you feel you can trust and that you feel you know isn't going to judge you judge you yeah I, I mean if you're in a committed relationship and that's the person that you've chosen to speak to then you would hope that they're not going to judge you um correct but just trying to be honest and just saying, look, I can't always explain how I feel, but this, you know, picking a time when you're not heightened with anxiety is probably best. Because I find when I'm in a really anxious state, words don't come out. And yeah. there's, there's just no way of me verbalizing how I feel. Uh, um, so I would say don't do it when you're feeling like that. When you're at your calmest, try and... Um, explain, or even write it down. I was about you know, to say exactly that. I was going yeah, to say to you, do you ever just, for yourself, do you ever write things and then just not not keep them? Because you could type it on your phone or your iPad and then just go, yeah, right, I mean, I, uh, I don't, just because I find it really difficult to um, focus on it. I think I have to be in a very specific place mm -hmm. to sort of almost pay attention to my anxiety. I think I spend a lot of time trying to shut it away. So the idea of having to write it down would bring it to the forefront of my mind. And I probably should. It would probably be quite cathartic and helpful. There's a word I was going to think about. It's cathartic. Yeah. It's a good word. Yeah. I mean, I have in the past, to be fair, many, many years ago. Um, well, maybe it's something you can do again. Yeah. Maybe you can make a, a, a commitment as the podcast is your silent witness <laughs> that you're going to try some you know methods yeah. to help yourself well, I, you know lots of people do journaling and stuff like that as a way to document and to write down their feelings um so you know lots of people do find it very helpful you did this once a long time ago what you wrote down a journal entry a long time oh. ago i remember yes i did that was yeah. many many years ago um but yeah, I think if you're really struggling to tell people, writing it down is... You're also telling really yourself, way. right? Because as you say, you shut it away. But by shutting it away, you're denying some of your own self. Mm -hmm. And you're not treating yourself with the respect that you would want others to treat you. So that whole Bible quote of uh, whatever it is, like, do unto others as you would have done to you kind of thing, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> it starts at home. And it starts with you being good to you. And I think this is one of the most important things that you could do for yourself is to be true to oneself. Yeah. It doesn't matter if you don't tell others internally what you're thinking. But if you can be true to yourself, you can say, right, well, I've done this now. I've said this to myself. Now I've done it. Maybe I don't feel any better. Maybe I do. But you won't know till you do. I think it's, a, it's really important to not hide bits of yourself away from yourself because what happens is then you bottle up something and like a, a can of, of drink 
or a champagne bottle that has been shaken up in the car on the way home after Christmas dinner and then you open it up a few days later and the cork pops out and nearly smacks you in the face. I'm, I'm not paraphrasing or thinking of anything in particular. No, not at all. Um, it can it can just jump out. Mm. You know what I'm talking about? I do. Yes. That recording will be saved for closer to New Year. But you will get it. <laughs> but yeah, like, you can't keep yourself like a shaken bottle. Because it's not it's not fair to you. Mm. It's not fair to you. And anyone listening as well, if you're an anxiety sufferer, it's not fair to you to hide yourself away from yourself. It's very true. So the whole title of this podcast episode being I'm Tired of Being Tired is not necessarily to do with anxiety, but it's to do with something else because it's, it's kind of more than one uh, situation in one this week. Yeah. So bring us on to the next portion of your thought processes today. So the whole tired issue is a relatively new thing, I suppose, more in the last year. Um, it I, could be since long COVID. It, to be it fair. could be. I, I don't know. I am awaiting referral to a hospital to be investigated for chronic fatigue um chronic fatigue syndrome they call it um due to symptoms of as as it states chronic fatigue and i guess what i wanted to try and explain to people is the difference between fatigue and oh i'm just really tired today because there is a huge difference and it sounds so menial and I think so many people just see it as well, you're just being lazy but actually when you constantly feel like your bones are weary and it doesn't matter how much you sleep how little you sleep it, nothing makes you feel rested I suppose you know everything takes it out of you and for me it's been something that has crept up slowly, I would say, over the last particularly year. Um, no, maybe two years. But since after Christmas, this, you know, Christmas just gone. So January of this year, it's been significantly worse and progressing quite quickly. Um, and that too, combined with the anxiety, can put you in a very difficult place because you do that voice again then says to you well you're just being lazy you don't need to sleep you don't need to rest you need to get up and you need to just get on with it and push through but actually the pushing through and the not resting just completely makes it you know a, a horrible spiral and you end up in you know a very dark. down place and dark place yeah um and not enough sleep means the voice has more free reign, you see. Exactly. Because when you're tired, you know, you're much more susceptible to all those negative thoughts. Um, and for me, there are, well, for everybody who actually has, you know, chronic fatigue or ME or any of those, uh, that sort of category of illnesses, there are always other symptoms. Um and that's what makes it quite a a difficult thing to actually diagnose. You can't just have a blood test or, you know, see one GP and they say, oh, yeah, this is what you've got. Off you go, take these tablets, you'll be fine. There is nothing. There is no real cure. There's the helping the symptoms, but there there is no no fix. Um, and, and, you know, obviously I, I'm not diagnosed yet, but I fit a huge part of those symptoms. And I am by no means anywhere near on the scale like some people that we know yeah. or have spoken to who, you know, their lives are completely run by the fatigue. Um, and I have joined a Facebook, you know, group just to try and get some information on maybe ways to manage it or things that might be helpful or just to find other people that have similar experiences and stories um and 
their situations are by far much, much worse than mine. So I am not trying to sit here and say, oh, my life is so awful because I have chronic fatigue. But it, it, it is a horrible place to be sometimes when you just feel um, like you're not doing enough. Particularly for me, when my life kind of revolves around looking after our family and our house and I can see around me the things that I am not able to do in the same way that I used to be. Um, I also, I think maybe even a bigger symptom than the tiredness for me is the forgetfulness and the brain frog. <laughs> see? <laughs> I like that. The brain fog. Um, that means that I forget <laughs> things all the time and have forgotten huge parts of my previous years um you know and when friends and family are saying oh remember when we went and did this or remember we saw this at the theater or remember when that happened and I have no recollection whatsoever of that um that's not a nice place to be either and you know the children saying to me oh remember this or I said I said this to you last week. Do you not remember that happening? No, I don't remember at all. And it's a running joke in the family. Oh, mum forgot again. Um, but that's quite scary because I don't, I don't know what I forgot. I don't, you know, if I you can't get did that. If I did, forgot, I'd be okay. Then you wouldn't have forgotten it. Exactly. Um, it, you know, with all those, all those things, it's like, is this going to, progress is it going to get worse am I going to forget more and more and more I don't know I don't know if anybody can ever give me that answer I'm not sure because like I said I'm waiting for a referral but it's um yeah it's quite it's quite intimidating but I would say so yeah and that's why we wanted to put these two things in this episode because we feel like they kind of go hand in hand even they if it may do. not have seemed so in the beginning but you see, we tied it together. Yeah. So how do you mitigate the tiredness? What can you do for that? I mean, anxiety is one thing, yeah. but this whole tired thing is another. Like, yeah. what are your steps, if you have any, for? I am very much learning how to manage this. Um, I am very lucky that I have very supportive people who are not dismissing me and saying, you're just being silly, just get on with it. No, no one you my family no one has ever said that to me um thankfully I think if you are in that situation where you have people that are not believing you or you know not accepting that that's how you feel that must be a horrible place to be um but my mum is constantly saying to me you need to pace yourself um you know you need to take time you need to rest in between things so you must listen to her she's a medical practitioner <laughs> she is um and she is a a wise woman yes um and she's extremely helpful and will help me in whatever way it it may be driving me to places or you know just whatever she can do um so i mean obviously disney was you know a big a big thing and I knew that that was coming. And I think one of my big anxieties, <clears throat> sorry, about that was not having the energy for the kids to get through it. Um, and that we did push ourselves because you're only there for a few days. You know, you have to. Yeah, you kind of got no choice. Get on with it. Yeah. Um, and I knew that afterwards coming back was going to be hard. And it was. I spent a lot of time not being able to do much around the house. So I'm trying to make sure that I don't do what I used to do, which would be, you know, spend the entire day cleaning the house, doing stuff, running around, being busy. I'm trying to make sure that each day I plan maybe one activity, one thing that needs to be done. And then taking the time to rest in between those things because there you know life still has to go on I still have to look after the house and cook and 
clean and walk the dog and all of that. So it's just trying to make sure that in between each of those things, I'm listening when my body is saying to me, okay, that's enough now. One thing has stopped though, and that is the school run. So that yeah. does give you a little more time in the day it does. to do a few things. Yeah. And it does mean, for example, that if I wanted to take my wife out to lunch, um, <laughs> not having to get back at, you know, dead on 10 to 3 or something, no, we can do true. that. We haven't yet done it because it's bloody cold outside. Uh, but, you know, I have plans to be able to treat you like a woman, like you deserve, in the new year. So, you know, it will be nice. Well, it is also one of our anniversaries coming up soon. So that might be a good excuse to force us to actually yeah. go and do something. Well, yeah, there is that. Yeah. yeah that'd be true. <laughs> I think, you know, we end on sort of a positive note if we can, because this is a tough one, isn't it? Um, yeah. Even before the recording, you'd said, ah, oh, this is going to be tough. I feel the yeah. adrenaline rush and not the good kind. No. And talking about it is difficult and elevated heart rate and all that. So well done yeah. to you. Thank you. Anyone else out there, if you listen to this and you find yourself um, sympathizing or understanding any of the, the previous parts of the conversation, do get in touch if you want to. Don't feel pressured. But look online for resources. Um, I'm not sure that we have any this week to really link to specifically. But no. there are places for you to find out information that maybe pertains to your situation you're not alone and never feel like you are the only one with whatever you're suffering from because there's always someone out there and hopefully there's more people like us talking about this stuff raising awareness is what i like to call it yeah because if you can find somebody that will listen to you and pay you the proper attention you can pretty much do anything or at least do more of the things that you want to do anyway. So, thanks for listening to episode 9. No idea what episode 10 will be. We haven't even gone that far yet. But, <laughs> here we are. Maybe, maybe you guys could throw some ideas of things that you... Yes, we go about like anything, right? About. Positive or negative, good or bad. We will, you know, we're trying to do like a mixture of podcast stuff here. Just nothing done. political. No, We no. don't go down that road. We've avoided any of that for very good reason, both on the UK and the US side. Yeah. We're avoiding anything to do with that. But there we are. Thanks for listening to another episode of Strangecast. And we will catch you soon. Bye. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's the time of year, to be fair. <laughs> I am, I'm also suffering it's, with a cold. It's all this talking. It's dried Trying me out. Trying to keep out. it away from you guys. You don't want to catch it through the podcast. No, no. Pod cold. Um, you did great. Was it okay? Yes. I feel like I coughed and mumbled my way through some of it. I wanted to blow my nose so hard. Oh, <laughs> But I didn't. Oh, dear. No, you did good. Thank you. I see the runtime. I'm curious.